Well, we are we are really starting to move into First Peter um, with the approach that the Holy Spirit has given me, and um, so Phase One was sort of to take you through it and to get your opinions on things, and then to throw out little seeds. Uh, phase Two uh, that we've begun some time back, and we really officially started Phase Two when we uh, looked up. Uh, what uh, salvation of the soul related to. And then we went to Psalms and all of that. <clears throat> and so we've been, what we've been doing up to this point is we've been taking words or phrases, and this is phase two, and this is, has nothing to do with the coronavirus phase two. <laughs> this, this has to do with getting healed properly. Um, is that we are, uh, going to continue for a while <clears throat> looking at different phrases or words in First Peter and, um, and seeing them usually in light of, of uh, context or, well, let's put it this way, in light of other verses within Peter, First Peter. And if you remember, I told you that um, his definitions are all there in the book. They just, you just have to, if, if it doesn't seem to make sense over here, you'll find over here at least one or two different phrases where he uses it, where he's defining it. And then you take that definition back to the one that didn't seem to, and you'll look around and you go, there it is. There it is. That's the meaning of, of those words. And, um, so we're going to do this for a while in like phase two <clears throat> to just check out a whole bunch of different ones to begin to, to, to um, you know, sort of place into our minds uh, how they fit with other verses. But then <clears throat> as we approach phase three, we're literally just going to have been armored with all of the phrases and the words and definitions. We're going to just go right through the book of First Peter, and it should be fairly simple then, because <clears throat> most of it will have been the groundwork for it would have been laid as we in the areas of what we're particularly doing right now. So the first one that I want to really deal with uh, tonight is suffering for well doing, and particularly the word well doing. Um, I, w I would like for us to begin to understand what that means. And then um, if we have time, I would like to move into <clears throat> well-doing, well, the, the phrase, the will of God. But I want to connect well-doing with the will of God. And then if we have enough time also, these really won't take much time because they're clumped in different areas in First Peter. <clears throat> I want to look at the lust of the flesh and what Peter's definition of the lust of the flesh is, okay? So, uh, well-doing is what we're going to start with, and then hopefully we can move to the truth. And these are not separate truths I'm talking about. These are joined truths that Peter uses regularly. All right, well-doing, the will of God, and then the lust of the flesh, depending on how much time we have tonight. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, let's start with First Peter chapter two. <clears throat> First Peter two, and um, let's look at verse eleven and twelve. And we're going to have that phrase, well-doing, or good works, uh, but particularly as we'll go on here, we'll see well-doing is the word that's used over and over. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation, which we know is not words, but your lifestyle, but your lifestyle in Peter includes how you speak and what you speak or don't speak. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers. Isn't that interesting 
that he doesn't just say they speak evil against you because some people will speak evil against you and some people won't and there's just the there's just some people are just that way and some people are this way he's talking about speaking against you <clears throat> as evil doers now we've we charted some things on the board in a couple of the last classes and we were able to see what the real meaning that peter uh, has called an evildoer. And we may even get into that one some more, uh, just to clarify. <clears throat> but he says, whereas they speak against you as evildoers. So for Peter, this is a very specific kind of speaking against. This is a very pointed, it, it, from, from the enemy's point of view, which is to um, break down the lamb in you so that you react in the flesh to the Lord's point of view where he gets the nature of Christ out of you in, in the midst of those kind of things <clears throat> which would be entering into the sufferings of Christ because it's by Christ that you're going through that in other words you're going through that with him right now in this in our lifetime and in our the, those circumstances that have people speaking against you that do so as evildoers. We'll, we'll, go, we'll, we'll explain more as we go. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, they, may, uh, they may by good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, hasn't it been, we haven't got to that one yet, but hasn't it been interesting that we've, through Peter, we've had the day of visitation. We've had the words, the last times. We've had the words <clears throat> um, uh, at that, his appearing. Uh, at, you know, and all those words are used because that's the culmination of the pattern that I had you look for in the scriptures when we first began. And I marked it on the board with those, those uh, circles. And, um, and you did so well. You spotted the the pattern so um, that's this is these words here are ending with the thing that ends the pattern again all right and then let's look at verse 15 for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men okay the ignorance of foolish men well what foolish men is he talking about he's talking about the evildoers how do you know that? Because he said, whereas they speak evil, uh, speak against you as evildoers, um, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. That's the evildoers that have been speaking against you. Okay? All right. So uh, the phrase well-doing, this is something that I had taken out of my notes. <clears throat> um the rest of, of the verse, which is uh, verse uh, 2.15, is saying that being, being, um, gosh, how do you put it? Peter uses this word a lot, submitted, submit to your, your husband, submit to your elders or leaders, submit to this and that. But in every case, it's that spirit of the lamb submission when they're, uh, abusing their power at times or they're doing this or that I mean he's specifically trying to bring that out which we haven't got to all of those examples yet either um, so uh, the the rest of this verse is saying that being submitted in the sense that we don't fight back we don't retaliate we don't uh, talk bad about them or, or rail against them or whatever but we're submitted is saying that being submitted to men who are evildoers which he terms this submitting as well-doing. Yeah, and, and we're, guess what? My statement of that being the case is not enough. We're going to have to go through the scriptures tonight and see that, okay? But I'm making a statement here. Um, the, the rest of that verse is saying that being submitted to men who are evildoers which he terms as this submission, as well-doing, is God's method for dealing with people who have no clue of lamb life. Foolish and ignorance. Foolish men 
and the ignorant. Okay? Um, Peter uses it to mean that we live by the Lamb in terms of non-retaliation, but to suffer unjustly in a right spirit. And the key is the right spirit, or what, what would be the best way to identify right spirit? Well, you could say the Lamb of God in us. You could say uh, Christ crucified. You could say the, by the mind of Christ, because they all are the same being and represent that being's way and his spirit uh, in a right spirit. So it's not, so what we're not saying is uh, that you have to, you have to get a right spirit. No, we're, we're looking for Jesus. We're looking for being with Jesus in us, in his sufferings, and he'll take you through that. Because if they're talking about you, they're talking about his body. I mean, you, you know, you get that with, um, you get that with Paul, who, who, when he was Saul, was persecuting uh, believers and everything, and Jesus knocks him down on the road to uh, Damascus and, and says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And, and my, because this, this was sunk into me when I was very young, uh, he could have replied, um, I'm not persecuting uh, you. I'm persecuting these Christians. But Jesus looks at us as his body, as him. That if you, you know, if you've done this to the least, of I mean, you've done it unto me. That he sees this that way. And so, uh, so when they're doing that to us and he's in us, we're, by his nature, we're with him in that spirit. We're fellowshipping with him in his sufferings. Okay? All right. So, um, so in uh, also 1 Peter chapter 3, now, not 2, but 3, verse 17. Let's look at this one. <clears throat> For it is better, if the will of God be so, that, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. <laughs> okay, now you're getting to the point. If you really grasp what he just said, he's saying that um, we, we would have read this, and probably in the early days when we I asked you, what do you think the meaning of this was? Some might have assumed that this is, well, I'm being a good Christian, and I'm going to church, and people don't like me, you know, loving Jesus, you know, on the job because, you know, this or that, and that, and I'm suffering for well-doing. That is, that may be persecution, but it's not the sufferings of Christ. Uh, and even Peter calls persecution, he calls it, his definition of it isn't that, it is this, suffering the sufferings of Christ. Um, so he's saying that, um, for it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing, for not speaking up, for not justifying yourself, for not pushing forth your agenda, for not uh, acting all indignant and, and uh, righteous indignation and all the things that we term that are not in the Bible <laughs> and all these things. And we, we you know, and we respond back because it's only right, because this is wrong, and I'm right, I'm Mordecai, and I'm the right thing, you know. And uh, so that's, this is the way, what we do. Well, he's saying it is better that you suffer for, because you're in the midst of well-doing, which is the nature of Christ, and not doing those things, than for being an evildoer then for evil doing because we've seen that evil doing and do evil doer is the same thing it is those that um, uh, that that persecute you unjustly those that attack you those that uh, think up lies or whatever and and if you attack back not railing remember not railing for railing uh, not you know doing those kind of things um, uh, if you do it back, then you're, you're going to suffer for evil doing. Okay? So, 
again, I put uh, the definition of well-doing here is consistent with chapter 2 that we read in those two verses, three verses, with the meaning of the lamb not opening your mouth and railing back. That's what, that's what uh, 2, uh, 11 and 12 and 15 and now 3, 17 is saying and they're all being consistent together. And when you put them all together and you read it, you'll see many of the same words uh, that, that are used among them. For example, and here we're going to get the chance to do it. I, I wrote down both chapter 215 and chapter 317 use the phrase well-doing. They both use it, two different chapters, and they both use the term the will of God. The will of God. Now, they're only talking about one subject. They're talking about this spirit and this way of reacting, which is non-reactionary. <laughs> it's reacting with the nature of Christ. It's non-reactionary. And so, in those verses that's talking about that, it's speaking of it being the will of God. Now, <clears throat> uh, if Peter hasn't taught us anything, he's taught us that whatever Paul's definitions are, Peter's not going with that in this book. He's got, he is laser focused to, to accomplish a task that he deeply feels because he failed in that so many times. And he's right now and he wants us to be right also. And so the phrase, um, the will of God, well, you know, <clears throat> we could use that for, is it the will of God that I, uh, go to so-and-so church? Is it the will of God that I marry so-and-so? Is it the will of God that, you know, uh, I turn left on this street instead of right? I don't know. I mean, I've heard so many examples of, is it the will of God that it'd blow your mind? Well, you don't get confused when you talk with Peter. You don't get confused at all because he'll tell you what he's talking about. He'll tell you exactly what he means. So, so he, in these same verses that talked about well-doing, the subject is that it's the will of God. Okay, so again, don't listen to me what I'm telling you. Let's look at Peter. Let's look at the verses there and let's see if they match up. Okay, so um, again in chapter 3, verse 17, uh, let's see, let me do this first. Let's go back to 2.15. 1 Peter 2.15. For so is the will of God. For so is the will of God that with well-doing. Well-doing, we just described and went through the scriptures and saw that his version of well-doing was to not be an evildoer, but to be, let Christ be formed in you. And that when you go through the sufferings of Christ, you are um, what God was, would call well-doing, or, or Peter would call well-doing, but God would more specifically call the nature of Christ at work in you when you're suffering wrongfully and unjustly and still not standing up for your own rights in that sense. All right, so... Um, for so is the will of God, that with well-doing, that, that you don't, um, this is how you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You don't um, sit down to him and say, look, here I have proof that well, all the stuff you're accusing me of is not true. Look, read this paper. I've got, uh, you know, I wasn't even in the state at that time you said that I did that or whatever. And uh, here's this and that. I have you know, uh, five witnesses that know my heart, and they would they would tell you that I would never do something like that. And da da da. da. Well, maybe you wouldn't. Maybe you would never do that. He's not looking for what you would never do. He's looking for what you will do. Will you live Christ in that situation? You know, you can justify based on. Well, I don't. I, that's. I mean. <laughs> Trust me, I know what I'm talking about because I've failed in these areas and the Lord's, by that, brought me more and more into His heart. 
um, was accused at one time of something I would never do. It just it was not in me to do. And oh, I was so indignant. And so this is wrong. And they don't even know me. Well, yeah, they maybe don't know you, but you're supposed to help them know Jesus, the Lamb of God, Christ crucified, not explain yourself. And so, uh, so with, uh, so this is, he's saying, this is the will of God, that with this kind of action, you can put this, them to silence. We say, well, how did that happen? Well, look at the cross. Look at, look at, I mean, in the, in the interim, no, nobody was shut down or anything, but he's not trying to shut anybody down. He's trying to make known his nature and his father and the Holy Spirit's trying to make known the Lord and trying to make known the kind of life that is the God life, if you will. And um, so, so this is, he's saying, this is, this is the will of God right here. This is what the will of God is. All right. So then now back to 1 Peter 3.17. <clears throat> For it is better if the will of God be so. Okay, so, so we read that and we go, okay, well, how will I know if it's the will of God? Because <laughs> we're thinking like Paul again. Peter knows what the will of God is in, in this instance. He always knows what the will of God is when you get into a situation like this. He knows exactly what it is, see? And so he's saying, if this, is, if this is that, if this is that situation, then this is what should happen. If it's not the will of God, in other words, if you're not in the middle of, because that's all he's talking about in this book, if it's not in the middle of the sufferings of Christ and you being falsely accused and all that stuff, well, you better check with the Holy Spirit for direction. But I ain't going to talk on that subject. I'm going to talk about... What is the will of God to Jesus for us if we could be with him in his sufferings in this spirit instead of denying him or instead of rebuking him in front of the front of the body saying, you know, Lord, let it not be so, you know, when Jesus is talking about going to the cross and suffering wrongfully and being mistreated and, and by this, the, the priests and the elders and the, all that that he mentioned. And Peter's reaction is no. And he said, you know, get behind me, Satan. You savor the things that be of men and not the things that be of God. All right, there are things that God savors. That should touch our heart. That should, that should make us a little closer to knowing him, if we understood that little tete-a-tete -tete between Peter and Jesus at that moment, and Jesus said, the things that you are saying are certainly men, they, they would go, no, no, you shouldn't go to the cross. You've never done anything wrong. We know your heart. You're a good man. You're, you're, you know, you're the son of God. I just said, you know, three verses back that you're the son of God. And you shouldn't have to go through this. Um, but instead, to know him enough to know his nature and to know that it, the way that he really is and to say, I'm with you. I, I want to be with you in this. And you know what that led to. I mean, he's saying to Peter, you know, you're, you savor the things that be of man and not the things that are of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you don't get it right, very shortly here, you're going to be denying me three times. That didn't come up right that minute, but that's, that's what happened. That was the exact path that this whole thing took. Okay. So, so, um, for it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing. Okay, you go, well, I don't want to suffer for well-doing. If I'm wrong, then I'll take it. I'll take it. But if I'm right, well, God bless my pee-picking heart. I, I don't want to suffer for well-doing. Well, first of all, he's not talking about because you're an upstanding Christian. 
and you're going to suffer for being an upstanding Christian. Again, this relates to the nature of Christ and us being with him in that spirit. So uh, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil doing in, 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 instead of being an evildoer. So he's saying, so he's putting Jesus, Jesus putting himself in a picture form. Uh, uh, and then Peter has seen that picture form. And Peter is placing Jesus, as it were, before excuse me, his persecutor before the, the high priest, before all those who are bringing in false witnesses and bringing in all of that and coming to, to slap him and to, to do all those things to him. He's placing him there and he's saying, it is better that Jesus suffer for being right, for being of, a, of that spirit that would not retaliate back is better than that he become an evildoer. Or he could put you in that situation and say, it's better that you go through this with him than without him, but standing up for you and your rights. Okay. Uh, the next verse, verse 18, that's verse 17, 3, 17, verse 18. For Christ also hath suffered, hath once suffered. Oh my God, what is this talking about? What's the subject talking about? Randy, you're just, you're just making it sound like it's, well, this is the next verse. We didn't read it when I went through well-doing because I didn't want you to fully believe me until we got to this so that you could see the context is clearly Christ crucified, what happened to him, and what Peter is saying, we need to be with him in that spirit when we enter into those things. Um, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Okay, now, should I deal with that right now? No. Uh, I want to say that you will find, and you don't have to trust me, you can wait, you will find that when he's talking about suffering for sins here, he's not Paul. He's Paul, you know, Paul set forth and was used of God to set forth that truth in relationship to um, all of our sins. But what, what Peter is talking about right here is that... Uh, he suffered for sins that he didn't commit. And it'll go on to say that and spell it out. So I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to clue you. And then if, uh, and it's always wise that you not believe me, and I'm always up for that, but that you go search the scriptures and you find out what it says. And then if you disagree with me, that's fine too. I mean, I don't, I don't know everything, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't fight you back. I wouldn't argue with you. Anyway, so um, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. That we don't have time to, to do this now but we'll come to that okay so this is saying that the will of god as far as peter defines it um, is to suffer wrongly but patiently in a right spirit of not answering back or justifying okay so now we were in chapter two of peter uh, first peter and then we went to chapter three of first peter now let's go to chapter four of first peter and see if this guy really is saying the same thing all the way through, now, you know, this is, we're still early in all this, so I don't expect you to fully see that. But this is how we're going to see it. If we keep seeing it, keep seeing it, and then the time when we finally just go, let's just go through the scriptures all together and, and see if it doesn't pan out. All right. First Peter 4, 1 and 2. For as much then as Christ hath suffered... 
for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Okay, so, so now let's think about that for a minute. If he's saying Christ hath, uh, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, then you need to be ready to suffer for others the same way. Well, if, if it, this is really talking about that he died for our sins, we can't suffer the same way. He already settled it all. It's not like that we're, uh, he, he did that, but we can join with him not in suffering for uh, the sins of the world, but for the sins that we're being accused of. All right. Um, <clears throat> Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time, the rest of his time, in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. All right. So, I wrote down a few things. Number one, first it shows that Christ suffered. Okay. Then, it states that this is a mind that we should be armed with. That's really two things. First, it shows that he suffered. Then it shows that this is a mind, a mindset. Likewise, arm yourselves with the same mind. Um, and it's also your armament. It's what you're armed with. You're, it's, it's not like, this is, you know, this is hard to understand for some people. It's not like you're just a, you, you know, you're a pacifist. It's not that. The, this refers to the power of God, talked about in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. The, the cross, Christ crucified, is the power and the wisdom of God. It is not being unarmed and therefore brutalized. It is, it is making sure that you're armed lest you be just brutalized for trying to do this without the, the mind and nature of Christ crucified. It's ridiculous. I, w I, I in no wise suggest that you just try this without, number one, it being the Lord and that you understanding this whole thing that, that Peter's talking about um, and that you be with him in it. Because if you do, I'll tell you, the enemy will just rip you to shreds and there won't be any, any glory out of it at the end, especially any glory for the Lord. It'll just be that you were a pacifist. And, you know, I, I, he's trying to give us armaments here. And his mind, whoo, in us is an armament. All right. So, uh, arm, arm yourselves likewise. With the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Okay, so I said first it shows what Christ suffered, then, the, uh, then it states that this is a mind that we should be armed with, and then it states that with this mind we no longer live to the flesh, to the lust of men. I could stop right now or I could keep going, but this, um, all right. So we're gonna move into the final portion because I wanted, I was hopeful that we could um, hit these three things because they're, these three things, the, the uh, uh, well-doing, the will of God, and this mention of the lust of the flesh uh, are all three entangled in everything that we've been saying in the scriptures that we've been showing. They're, they're all in there. So, <clears throat> let's, let's do this then. The definition of lust ties into the meaning of the will of God and to well-doing. It is not general lusts of the flesh, but in context of standing up, uh, uh, but in the context of either standing up for your rights and using your mouth to justify or to rail back or 
to have his spirit and, and to be armed with his mind. Um, the lusts are representative of a specific desire of the flesh. Now, this is going to play itself out. We won't, get a, we won't get all of them right now. But this is going to play itself out in the book of Peter. Okay? Um, the lusts are representative of a specific desire of the flesh to get back at someone or to show everyone you've been wronged unjustly. That's this lust. It's a desire. It's a, I have this, this overwhelming thing that wants to drive me, um, uh, again, push back against what they're saying or doing or to, to, to show the, the people over here, don't listen to them. Listen, I can tell you stuff that they're twisting and turning and all this kind of stuff. Um, that's, a, that's the lust of the flesh that he's talking about, and it will always be in this context. He won't go off into, you know, there's one place I think that he does, but then he ends it with this again. <laughs> I love I just love it. I love how he is. All right. Um, uh, here again, it ties the definition of the will of God to suffering in the manner that Christ died. All right. So now let's, uh, let's wrap this thing up. Uh, with looking at the scriptures in relationship to the lust of the flesh, okay? Uh, 1 Peter 2, back, let's go back to 1 Peter 2, verse 11 and, and 12 and 15, because within those, we explored first the, the uh, uh, well-doing, and then we came back and we found in the same scriptures, there's, oh, look, this is the will of God. This is saying that this is the will of God. And then now we're going to go back and go, oh, lust of the flesh are mentioned in these areas too. And how does that pertain? Okay, so 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12 and 15. Dearly beloved, uh, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Ah, salvation of the soul. We took a lot of time looking at that, and that is in the middle of the persecution, in the middle of the things that are going wrong and people are being uh, unjust in their judgments. And, and in the middle of all of that, uh, David is crying out in the Psalms, Lord, save my soul. He doesn't say, Lord, get them. He says, you know, he's talking about the, the, the salvation of his soul because he has these lusts, this particular individual lust that Peter talks about that uh, wants to retaliate, that wants to rail back. And he wants, he doesn't want that to happen. So he's crying out for the salvation of his soul. Okay? So, as abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul having your conversation, your life, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, so there it is. See, it's tying this directly in to the soul and the being uh, and to the work of the evildoers to try to get that soul to react, to, to do what Peter did, to deny Jesus, to deny the Lord, okay? That... For whatever reason, that pleases the devil that you deny the Lord, in, but in the most, the most uh, holy place that you deny the Lord. Okay, so uh, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, <clears throat> they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Okay, so you got two things there. You've got fleshly lust and abstain from it and look out because it's going to mess with your soul. And then you've got the good works which they shall behold and it's going to glorify God. That's the end. That was, remember the pattern we said, the only reason why someone would go into this, this um, uh, setting of having this kind of abuse thrown at them would be, that they want to glorify God in the end. In the end of it, in the last time of it, in the appearing of it, it want, they want Jesus to appear. All right. So, glorify God in the day of visitation. All right. So now let's look at 1 Peter 4.19, and this will be our last verse. 
First Peter four nineteen. Um, you know what's funny is that there are. I didn't put in here. Well, let's look at. Let's let's go to First Peter four, uh, verse two, that he no longer should live the rest of his life. Ah, let's read 1 and 2. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in, in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh uh, to the lust of men, but to the will of God. There it is. Um, Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, speaking against you as evildoers, that they may buy your good works. They're going to see, what are the good works then? The good works here are the exact opposite of living by the lust of the flesh, which means all that, you know, um, coming back and justifying and anger and hurt and, you know, all the things that we go through. That's, that's our flesh, folks. I mean, this is telling us that that's our flesh. We go, no, 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 it's not. It's not my flesh. It's, it's um, you know, it, it's that I, I'm standing up for the Lord. No, if it's to that degree, you're standing up for you. Um, so now, verse 19 in chapter 4 that we just read, verse 1 and 2. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God... Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their soul. Do you see how this is tying together? If you're suffering according to the will of God, it's, it's by being the Lamb and allowing Him to live through you. Uh, but there's another important thing. Committing, commit the keeping of your souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. We'll even deal with that faithful creator part too because you go, well, that's weird. No, it's not as weird. Not to Peter, it's not. All right. So, this is not saying that if some random things uh, uh, that we would consider to be the will of God, but is speaking of suffering in the way of how Christ suffered. Every bit of it is talking about suffering in the way that Christ suffered. And of course, ultimately, by Christ, you pass through that. You pass through it by his nature, but you pass through it with him. You're with him. You're with him in his sufferings. And, and in that sense, he's with you in your sufferings. And when when you're passing through and then you've passed through the whole thing and you've been with him in that spirit, he is glorified. And that, that, that comes up every time at the end of the pattern. He is glorified that instead of denying him the way Peter did, you've stood with him and suffered with him without trying to justify him. Because see, that's what Peter did in uh, uh, Matthew 16 um, no not so Lord you know I'll justify you I'll justify me not you I'll no not you and Jesus is going you're doing the you're acting like an evildoer and he didn't use those words he used worse get behind me Satan but you're acting like an evildoer trying to justify me I don't want to justify this is not what I'm here for this is not my spirit that's not who I am you know <clears throat> this, uh, so it's not talking about a, some random thing that we think is the will of God, but speaking, all of it, speaking in the manner in which Christ suffered in relationship to his trial. All right, as usual, that's a lot, but it's not an hour's worth. Uh, I hope this is blessing you guys. I know it's got to be a little bit hard to catch everything, but you don't have to catch everything at this point. Remember that. 
if if I'm saying certain things that really are from God out of out of first Peter, I'm just I'm just putting them out there. Then there's seeds going into you. And the more we because we're just again in phase two, we're just barely into this one. But the more we get into the phrases and the definitions, the word definitions, and we start seeing and then see a little bit of the context. Then the day that we go into phase three, where we just say, okay, now we're just going to go through the book and I won't. And you know what? In phase three, I won't have to explain as much. Because even if you don't fully grasp everything at this stage, the spirit of God wants to reveal Christ crucified and wants us to get this. And Peter wants us to get this. And God saw thought enough of Peter who went through all that stuff that he he is trying to write it down and keep anyone else from having to go through what he went through, the negative part. Um, then the Spirit, if, if God thinks highly, that highly of him, then the Spirit of God is going to back that up for you and for me. So don't get discouraged at any point. Just stay open not to me but just say lord if that's true show me lord uh if uh you know show me your meaning you don't even have to i mean i'm giving you what i don't believe are my meanings i believe the lord showed me so and i know that he wants you to have it too i know that he does i know that's why we're having this class and this time together so let's pray Father, we love you and we love your son and we love the Holy Spirit who, who is so ready at every given moment of our life. Not, we don't even have to get to a certain state in that sense. He's at least ready. He's, he doesn't have to get into a certain frame of mind. He's there and he wants to reveal the son in us and, and not just to us. And he wants this son revealed in a certain way and that is as Christ crucified, as the Lamb of God. And he wants us to be with him, the, the son, that son, that one, that firstborn, that <clears throat> lamb. He wants us to be with him. And it means so much to him. And it is the gold standard when we can be there. It's more precious. We'll find out, Father, as we get there. It's more precious than gold. It is, he used that to help us understand what preciousness would mean to him in this. And help us, Father. And Father, that word precious is used quite a bit in First Peter. And it always has the same meaning. So we ask you to just move and open our hearts and eyes in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm telling you, it's just going to be fun as we get going. I mean, it's like a snowball. You make a snowball. And you start rolling it down the hill, and the more that it's getting momentum going down the hill, the bigger it gets, and it's going to pick up momentum. So it, it's going to happen for you, because I saw it happen in me. And it's just a sweet, sweet blessing from the Lord that he would open his heart in this way for us right now. Okay. Love you, folks. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Talk to you later.